Church Administration 202 deals with leadership development. And with leadership development comes the ability to do the Lord's Supper, conduct meetings, to conduct funerals and weddings, and other responsibilities that come along with being engaged as a ministry leader. Today we're going to talk about developing leadership competencies. This is adapted from material presented by Russ Conley and other staff members from the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. I hope this will help you as you learn to develop competencies of your own. Now on the next slide we're going to look at what you will learn during this our first lesson together. In this lesson you will learn several things. First, you will learn the four C's of leadership. These are extremely important. Then you will learn why an understanding of leadership really matters. It does matter. And much of this class will be devoted to leadership development. Another thing you will learn is the meaning of the word competencies and what competencies are important for a minister to possess. A fourth thing you will learn is leadership hierarchy and categories of leadership competencies. Now that sounds like a highfalutin set of words, but I will try to break it down as we come to it. And then disciple-making competencies. Certainly this is an important ingredient in every minister's vocabulary. Discernment competencies, administrative competencies, interpersonal competencies, notice the difference now, intrapersonal competencies, and then leadership that comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. It could be referred to as the Great Commandment, and we will examine the Great Commandment matrix. There are four elements in leadership that are absolutely indispensable if we're to be effective leaders. They all begin with the letter C. First, let's examine character. Character is who we are at our deepest level. Character is not typically changed when it has been molded and formed in a person's life unless the Holy Spirit begins to move that individual to change their character then that's what their character will be. What a pastor is in another community will be exactly the same when he's called to a new place of service. Character is important. Skills can be taught. Different issues can be faced, but character, if it is poor, will always taint the effectiveness and success of a minister. Context is the second C. That is an accurate understanding of current realities. When a pastor or a minister goes to a new field of service, it's imperative that he reach that point of understanding his context. He understands the realities all around him. He understands who lives in the community. He understands something about their income level, their interests, their desires, and their fears, and aspirations and hopes. Context is absolutely critical, and I find that this is one of those areas that most ministers neglect completely. The third C is capacity, the ability to perform at our highest level the majority of the time. Now we can't perform at a high level all the time, but we can the majority of the time. You can bring your A game the majority of the time. Capacity is our ability. Some have more capacities than others. Some have more spiritual gifts than other people do. Some have a more pleasing personality than others do. But all of us can increase our capacities. Now think. If your capacity is a 5 on a scale of 10, if you will major on your strengths, you'll be able to move your capacity up to perhaps a 7 or an 8. If you don't work at it, you will remain at a 5. And so it's worthwhile to increase our capacity, our ability. Sometimes that happens by experience, sometimes by education, oftentimes by a combination of the two. And then the last C is competencies. That's the necessary skills to be effective in a given context. Competencies help us to develop skill sets that then can catapult us to a higher level of leadership with a higher level of leaders who will follow us. 
if you were a leader at a level number five, a person who is already a six or a seven will never follow you. You must increase your capacity and your competencies to reach a higher level so that others who are leaders in their own right will follow you. Never forget that character, context, capacity, and competencies are essential in leadership. How would you define leadership? You see, it's important that you understand what leadership is because that will determine what competencies you will pursue. For example, if you believe that leadership is to be a dictatorship, then you will develop competencies that will make people subservient to you. If, on the other hand, you believe that leadership is to be servant leadership, you will be interested in cultivating an equipping type ministry so you can equip others to do ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe that leadership could be defined as laissez-faire, that is, hands-off, then you simply let everyone go in their own direction and do their own thing while you do exactly what you want to do. So the way that you define the word leadership will in all probability determine what competencies you will want to develop, what skill sets you will pursue. More importantly, the way you understand leadership determines the kind of leader you will be. Now here are a few points for you to ponder. Leadership is not a matter of the will. Exceptional leaders do not set out to be exceptional leaders. It seems to happen. It just seems to be ordained by God that they be exceptional leaders. A second thing, developing leadership competencies will not by themselves make you a leader, but they will make you a better leader. And the third thing, leadership rises out of context and expresses itself in the moment. It is the intersection of God's providential will, the fullness of His time, and the great need of the moment. It's when they all come together. Now on our next slide, we will see exactly what I mean as we see examples from Moses and Joshua. Esther chapter 4 verse 14 says, And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther certainly was appointed by God to be engaged in the deliverance of the Jewish people during a critical time in their history. And two other leaders that I want to emphasize over the next few moments also did the very same thing, that is, Moses and Joshua. From the previous slide, you will want to remember some of the points that I ask you to ponder. And now let me share with you what John Maxwell has said about Moses. What words come to mind when you think of a great leader? It is not the word meek. That would not appear at the top of your list. Yet that is the precise word God chose to describe Moses. Numbers 12.3 declares that the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Moses had reasons to be humble. He certainly wasn't a natural leader. Nothing in Scripture indicates he attracted or led anyone during the first 80 years of his life. Although he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds, we have no record of significant accomplishments during his first forty years. So far as we know, his first attempt at exerting his influence to help the people resulted in the murder of an Egyptian and his flight from the country. The next forty years Moses spent in exile in the desert of Midian, a time so uneventful that Scripture sums it up in three verses, found in Exodus chapter 2, verses 21, 22, and 23. You don't have to be a natural to become a great leader. You simply need a heart for God and a teachable spirit. Most of the great leaders in Scripture were made, not born. Happily for us, God is still making them today. I wonder if you could be one. And then Joshua. I want to share with you some things again that John Maxwell wrote. Look at every phase of Joshua's life and you see a man who gave himself wholeheartedly to completing whatever task was assigned him. The first time Joshua appears in Scripture, we see him immediately obeying the instructions of Moses. Thereafter, Joshua took on the role of Moses' assistant. 
Joshua again displayed his obedience when he agreed to spy out the promised land. Upon his return from the reconnaissance mission, he and Caleb, alone among all the spies, were ready to obey God and enter Cana. Forty years later, when Moses handed the reins of power over to Joshua, he again obeyed the call. In the end, the people of Israel followed Joshua's example and did what God asked of them. And as a result, they inherited the land God had promised. Scripture says that Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. That's found in Joshua chapter 24, verse 31. When the people followed Joshua's lifelong example of obedience, they prospered. By the time of his death, Joshua was known simply as the servant of the Lord. That's high praise. While today we consider Joshua an exceptional leader, nowhere does Scripture describe him as a man of extraordinary might, intellect, or talent. What made him extraordinary was his obedience. And when you're a servant of the Lord, that's all you really need. I hope that all of us can follow the example of Esther, Moses, and Joshua. With that introduction to leadership, let's turn our attention to competencies. You might ask, how can we define competencies? Well, according to Merriam-Webster's, it is the ability to do something well, the quality or state of being competent. Doing something well. Certainly we want to do ministry well and do it in the strength of the living God. So we want to be competent in all things pertaining to the work and our calling. Put your thinking cap on for just a moment and think of someone that you know or someone you know of that you consider an exceptional leader. What are some of the competencies that you think a leader should develop? What competencies do you see from that exceptional leader you know or you have had experience with? What words would you use to describe the skills that set them apart? Before you go to the next slide, I'd like for you to turn off this lecture and begin to think of that individual that you see as a great leader. Write down a series of words. Maybe they would be adjectives. Whatever those words are, use those words to develop your understanding of what it means to be a good leader with competence. Over the course of the remaining slides in this lecture, I want to share with you five categories of leadership competencies. These are absolutely essential for the effective minister. First, disciple making. We're going to spend several minutes discussing disciple making because I believe it is the most neglected part of the Christian church. We receive them in the front door, but we lose them out the back door because we don't make disciples of them. Every year there are about two million people who attended church in the previous year but drop out in the current year. They're not disciples. And then there is discernment. We're going to talk about that in some depth as well. And then administrative. That's an area that we need to give much attention to because if we're good administratively, it will save us much time. Then interpersonal and intrapersonal issues. We'll spend several moments on each of these. So let's get ready to look at disciple making first. As leaders in the church, we must make disciples. And discipleship competencies are not a given. We must develop them. Why should we be interested in making disciples? Why should we be interested in that competency? Well, first and foremost, because Jesus told us to make disciples. In Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, we understand that the imperative in that passage of Scripture is that we would make disciples of all nations, diethne, all nations, all ethnic groups, all people groups. And so Jesus told us that that's exactly what we are to do as his disciples. We are to make other disciples. We are to be reproducing disciples. What has been produced in us needs to then be reproduced in someone else, and they in turn reproduce that in someone else. And you see how the long line of concentric circles of influence move forward to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then churches who make disciples do not lack focus in ministry. They know what they are about and what they are to achieve. They know their purpose. 
their vision is to make disciples. And you could not have a better focus than to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Churches who make disciples do not risk irrelevance. There are some churches that have a message that's dated. It is irrelevant. But if you are a disciple-making church, you will always be relevant. You will always be meeting the needs of the people. Churches who make disciples do not risk ineffectiveness. We do find that some churches are very ineffective. We understand that of the 40,000 Southern Baptist churches, a large percentage, several thousand, do not baptize one person during the course of a year. That's ineffectiveness. If we ask the question, what's our business? And we say it's to reach people for Jesus Christ and help them to grow in Him. And we say we have no baptisms. Then we would have to say business is not good. And then churches who make disciples do not lack leaders. If your church has a shortage of leaders, it's because discipleship is not an imperative in the work that you're leading. I want to challenge you and encourage you to make disciples. That's a competency that you need to learn. The Bible says in John chapter 15 verse 8, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. How could we define the word disciple? Well, a disciple is someone who is abiding in Christ and doing what Jesus did. Abiding is described for us in John chapter 15, verse number 5. To abide means to dwell with. We're a disciple if we dwell with and allow the Lord Jesus Christ to dwell in us, and we do what Jesus does. Now, let's go help others learn how to abide in Christ and learn how to do what Jesus did while He was here on this earth. Let's go make some disciples. If we develop a competency for discernment, we need to know what it means. The definition again from Marion Webster's dictionary is the ability to see and understand people, things, or situations clearly and intelligently. We will look at some of the means whereby we can cultivate discernment in our next slide. If competency is the ability to see and understand people, things, or situations clearly and intelligently, then how can we develop that ability? Well, the first thing is to cultivate a lifestyle of prayer. Nothing is accomplished that's worthy of God apart from prayer. We can do many other things after we have prayed, but until we have prayed, we can do nothing of value. Wisdom is another ingredient that we need to cultivate often. I've been reading in the book of Proverbs lately in my devotional reading, and I came across Proverbs chapter 8. It talks about the availability of wisdom for all people. Verse 1 says, Does not wisdom call, and understanding lift up her voice? On top of the heights, beside the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates, at the opening to the city, at the entrance of the doors, she cries out, To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O naive ones, discern prudence, and O foolish, discern wisdom. Listen, for I shall speak noble things, and the opening of my lips will produce right things. We need wisdom, and we need it in the greatest way. And that is the only way for us really to cultivate discernment, is to develop wisdom. And wisdom comes through a prayer life. And then keep a teachable spirit. That is, you're always learning. You're always a student. You always want to develop another ability, another skill to take you to another level. Then biblically be informed and have a worldview that's shaped by the Bible. Our worldview is basically the way that we look at life. Develop a biblical one. Then have self-awareness. It's a good thing for every minister to take personality inventories and temperament inventories and those kinds of tests that can measure our strengths. Becoming aware of who we are and then learning how to lead out of our strength 
Some people try to improve their weaknesses. But I encourage people to try to develop their strengths because if you are weak, maybe a 2 or a 3 on a scale of 10, and you work really hard, you might become, if you're a 2, you might become a 3. But if you have a strength and it's a 5, if you work really hard, then you will reach the point perhaps of becoming a 7 or even an 8. So develop your strengths. And then humility. We need to practice humility. God's Word teaches us that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I certainly do not need the resistance of God on my life. God gives His grace to those who are humble. We have examined two competencies up to this point. The first was disciple-making, and then the second is cultivating discernment. On this slide, I want to talk briefly about administrative competencies. These are just examples. One is financial management, building and managing a budget. We've talked about this before in Church Administration 201, but we need to recognize that financial management is an important part of the administrative task we are assigned. That is, building and managing a budget. Building and managing a budget is a very important part of what our calling is all about. Then strategic and tactical planning. Designing and implementing systems. Systems is basically a method of getting things done. I have a prayer system that I use. It reminds me to pray. I use a method that was suggested to me by Dr. Peter Lord, who was a pastor in Florida for many years. He developed what's called the 2959 plan. That plan encourages us to pray for 29 minutes and 59 seconds every day. And it is my system, my process, my method of accomplishing my prayer ministry. So we must design and implement systems to be able to accomplish our work. Then meeting facilitation for efficiency and effectiveness. Meetings can drag on and on, and particularly if they do not have a purpose. Sometimes they are not efficient or effective even. So we as leaders need to develop that kind of administrative ability. And then learning how to manage or lead people. That is the last of the administrative competencies that I want to talk about, but there are many, many more. Now we turn to interpersonal competencies. I want to provide several examples. However, these examples are not exhaustive. Listening is the first one. We will never understand communication until we understand the awesome power of the listening ear. We need also to learn how to communicate clearly, to express ourselves in a way that's interesting and a way that commands attention. And resolution of conflicts. And in a class such as clinical pastoral education that I teach at Fruitland Baptist Bible College, we deal with the resolution of conflict. It's a very important area. Inspiration and the motivation of others. And then empathy. All of these are a part of interpersonal competencies. And now we come to the final and concluding category of leadership competencies. We've looked at discipleship making, discernment, administrative, interpersonal, and now we come to intrapersonal competencies. Again, examples include, but are not limited to, self-awareness. We need to understand our personality type. And I would encourage you to take the DISC or many other personality type indicators to help you understand who you are and what your strengths are. Your spiritual gifts. In Church Administration 201, I encouraged you to take the spiritual gifts inventory. I hope you did that then. If not, it's not too late. You can take a spiritual gifts inventory and determine what your gift mix is. And then your strengths and your weaknesses. There is an excellent book called Strength Finders. It's a book that allows you to take an online test that will indicate to you what your strengths are and where your weaknesses lie. I would encourage you to purchase that volume and find out what your strengths are. And then your core values. Self-awareness is extremely important. 
Our core values determine who we really are. And then our awareness of other people. Awareness of others is extremely important. Learning how people act, how they think, where their strengths are. We not only need to know their names, but we need to know what they're good at. We need to know if they're good with money if they're good with people, if they're outgoing, or if they're introverted. As we become aware of other people, we'll be able to minister to them in a much more effective way. Self-monitoring. Learn to act rather than to react. Self-awareness and self-monitoring perhaps could come under this verse of Scripture, again found in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5. The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. The ability to understand the purpose in your own heart is critical for assessing your own leadership style and your own motivation. A reminder from Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? And then in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, we find that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, and that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. On our next slide, we will look at a grid. A grid is called the Great Commandment Matrix. On this slide before you, you have the Great Commandment grid. It has four quadrants, and we're going to talk about leadership as it involves each of these four quadrants. You notice on the left-hand side, it talks about the love for God, and notice high and low. And then at the bottom of your screen, you'll see love for others, and you notice it goes from low to high. Now, I want to share with you the reading of Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse number 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. We find that this is the great commandment. We know the great commission, but sometimes we forget about the great commandment. Now, in the grid we're going to develop over the next several slides, we'll be talking about several leadership models. As these leadership models are developed, I hope that you will pray over the quadrant you find yourself and move to the most appropriate one, which will be obvious as we continue. Friends at the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina developed the grid you see in front of you. They give it the name, the Great Commandment Matrix. We're going to look at it grid by grid. Now re-familiarize yourself with the high and the low, the love for God and the love for others. Now let's look at the first leadership model. We're going to see that it is a low love of God and a low love for others. If we were talking about this theologically, we would say this is a self-centered position. And because it's a self-centered position, it's a very dangerous place to be because the great commandment matrix measures the spiritual side of leadership. Now let's examine this quadrant that you see in the lower left-hand corner. The leadership model that is portrayed here is manipulative and self-serving. It puts people as the means to an end. They are not valuable in and of themselves. They just simply help the leader reach his ambitions. And what is the scorecard for the leader? It's self-satisfaction. It's his ability to move up the ladder of success and for him to feel good about himself in his leadership role. Now we're going to take a look at another quadrant. In the first quadrant we examined just a moment ago, we discovered a self-centered leadership model that manipulates 
and is self-serving. Now we're going to look at a second leadership model. You'll notice that it is placed in a high love for God and a low love for people. This leadership model would be one the Pharisees embraced. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We find here the leadership model is dictatorial. Even though there's a love for God, there's a disdain for other people. The dictatorial leadership model places the leader above all the people. He has all the answers to all the issues and the people just simply need to follow him. The people feed the leader's ego. And the larger the ego of the leader, the more dictatorial he becomes. The goal is the conformance to the leader's will. You remember all the rules that the Pharisees felt the people needed to follow. One of the most embarrassing times in my ministry was when I visited the nation of Israel a number of years ago. I had the opportunity of going into a shop with the tour group I was leading. A merchant opened his store early for our group, and only our group was there. And one of the men looked at the gentleman behind the counter who owned the shop and said, Why are the Pharisees such evil people? And the gentleman took a very deep breath and straightened his back and said, Sir, I am a Pharisee. So they are Pharisees today, but they believe that they have all the answers. And if you just follow their rules, then everything will be okay. What's the scorecard? It's the praise of the people. There is that need for the people to be beholding to the leader, and the leader received the praise of the people. We can become intoxicated with the praise of people. The third quadrant of our leadership model is again very different. Notice the person here has a very high love for people, but a low love for God. If we call the first quadrant we examined self-centered, and we call the second quadrant religious-centered, we would call this one man-centered. Theologically, this would be the place where the social gospel would fit. It is that place where there is very little emphasis placed on the gospel of Jesus Christ, but lavish emphasis is placed on meeting the social needs of individuals. We need to recognize that it is important for us to have a good balance in outreach and evangelism and also meeting the very practical needs of human beings. Now, let's examine this leadership model. This person would be timid and uninspiring. The person we saw in the upper left-hand quadrant was an individual who was dictatorial. That individual would be perhaps brazen and very inspiring. But this one, in contrast, in leadership style, is very timid and uninspiring. The focus is to help people to feel good about themselves, about their situation, about their contribution to others. The goal is to build a leader's self-esteem. And the scorecard is the number of people who like the leader. We come to the fourth of the quadrants that we're examining in terms of leadership. We've looked at the leadership model that emphasized self-centeredness and religion-centeredness and man-centeredness. Now we come to the quadrant that we certainly want to be in, and that is the Christ-centered. If we were dealing, again, in theological terms, this would be the Christ-centered quadrant of our great commandment matrix. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 20, will describe this leadership model. It's the model of a servant leader. And certainly Jesus is the one that exemplifies this. People are the end. It's not pedestals. It's not power. And it's not position, but people are the end. The goal is to make disciples, who then make disciples. It is that process where people are transformed, and then instead of keeping that in the grip of their own hand, they allow that transferable concept to be shared with someone else, and then with someone else, and then with someone else. I challenge you to create a disciple-making culture in your church. And the scorecard is John 15, verse number 8, which says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. 
Remember our definition of a disciple? It's someone who is abiding in Christ and doing what Jesus did. You no doubt will see this on a test sometime in the near future. A disciple is someone who is abiding in Christ and does or is doing what Jesus did. John Maxwell has a wonderful article I want to share with you at this point. It talks about the servanthood that Jesus modeled for us. The Savior of the world proved himself to be the greatest servant of all time. The story is familiar to many and is found in John chapter 13 verses 1 through 20. When the disciples booked an upper room for their supper, they forgot to book a servant to wash dirty feet at the door, as was the custom. Yet when the disciples realized the servant was missing, none of them volunteered for the job. Instead, they argued over who was the greatest. When Jesus saw this, he decided to use the opportunity to present an object lesson. After supper, Jesus stripped down to a small piece of cloth around his waist, even looking the part of a servant. Then he took a basin of water and a towel and began washing the feet of his men. As he interacted with them, several lessons about servanthood became clear. 1. Servants are motivated by a love to serve others. Jesus' love was undeserved, unending, unconditional, and unselfish. Love made him serve. A second lesson from Christ-like servanthood is he possessed a security that allowed him to serve others. The insecure are into titles. The secure are into towels. Jesus' security enabled him to both stoop and stretch. Christ-like servant leaders imitate servant ministry to others. Jesus didn't wait for someone to clarify protocol. He saw a need, and he met it. Fourth, receive servant ministry from others. A servant's heart exposes pride in others. Peter had a hard time letting Jesus serve him. Number five in Christ-like servant leaders is that they want nothing to hinder their relationship with God. Peter moved from one extreme to the other. If Jesus offered to wash him, he didn't want to miss anything else that Jesus might do. Number six in this list of Christ-like servant leaders, they teach servanthood by their example. Jesus let them know that if the master washed their feet, they ought to imitate him. And then last, Christ-like servant leaders live a blessed life. Jesus reminded his men that they were blessed if they obeyed him. What should we do then to imitate the leader, our leader, Jesus Christ? Well, we should put others ahead of our own agenda. We should develop confidence and security to be willing to take a risk when necessary. Third, we should look for need, and we should take the initiative, not wait to be asked, but do it without being told. Fourth, perform small acts anonymously. Don't you just love to give something to someone and they don't know the source, and therefore the only person they can really thank is God? Number five, learn to walk slowly through the crowd. Number six, Begin your day by reflecting on your love for others and your love for God. And seven, develop a bias for action. I trust that you will be in this last quadrant that we have examined, that your leadership model will be that of a servant leader.